Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we feel pretty inadequate at times. We don't think we can handle what you give us. But that's when you say, no, through, your, through my spirit, I will give you the strength you need. Help us to see tonight the life of Moses, just how our inadequacy is something God uses for strength. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, during these Lent midweek services, we're again hearing from a number of biblical characters who saw God's will at work in their lives and what difference that made for them, but especially what we can learn from it as God's people today. Last week we heard from Isaac, the child of promise whom Abraham was prepared to kill, but God pulled away at the last moment. This evening, we're hearing from a man who felt utterly inadequate for the monumental task that God gave him, a man named Moses. You're going to have to be patient with me. I am not a good speaker. My name is Moses. Surprised by that? Maybe you were expecting some great, some, uh, some really powerful figure, a leader full of self-authority and confidence, a legend walking the earth like some god of sorts. Well, there was a time I, I did expect that, but I'm just a tired old man with a tired old tongue. So you're going to have to be patient with me. I, I'm just older than I look, and uh, I don't speak that well. I never have. But yeah, growing up in Pharaoh's house, I thought that poor speaking was the worst of my issues. But uh, you know the story. I was not Egyptian royalty. I was actually a Hebrew slave. I was rescued through river water, saved by a basket, my, my own personal Noah's Ark. But that was so long ago. I don't need to, to bore you with all those details anyway. You know about the murder, the escape from Egypt, about the parting of the Red Sea and the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. You've heard of those tablets of stone, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and the golden calf. But there's something I want to tell you about me before my funeral and I'm laid to rest. I, I've seen, I, I've done so much. You kind of get the idea of something like a hero, but when I'm looking back at my life story from the top of this mountain, I simply feel inadequate. You know, I didn't want to go back to Egypt. I didn't want to be the leader of God's people, those stiff-necked people that I learned to love so dearly. I certainly never set out to be the mouthpiece for the Almighty God. <laughs> Me! With my lack of speaking talent, talk about the wrong decision. I even told God that, too. I told the great I am that I was a lousy choice. I wasn't a good leader. No one would ever take me seriously with my awful speaking. And at that burning bush, I told him I wasn't up for the job. But he didn't listen to me. I said, Lord, please take somebody else. It wasn't that I didn't want to go back, although I didn't want to go back. It wasn't that I was afraid, though I was terrified. I just felt that, well, I wasn't up for the job. I wasn't brave enough, smart enough, or holy enough. Why would they listen to me? But in the end, my own inadequacy didn't matter. Oh, not to God. So God decided to use Moses, so he did. I wasn't alone. God gave me Aaron and Miriam to go with me, to share the burden of leadership. God put his staff in my hand to work his miracles of his word. So he sent me my inadequacies, my inability to speak well, and my huh, murderous ways to go do his will. I didn't look like a hero. 
leaving all those sheep behind out in the desert to go and call on Pharaoh's court. Pharaoh didn't believe me. The people of Israel didn't believe me. I didn't believe me either at times. But the great I am is greater than the gods of Egypt and my own personal inadequacy. The great I am would accomplish his purpose even when people are weak and doubting, confused and rebellious, incompetent and afraid, <laughs> like me. But then I learned firsthand that God can use inadequate people to do his saving work. The plagues of God took out those Egyptian gods one by one. Those miracles came through God's holy word, through my stumbling voice. The Lamb's blood covered our houses, and the angel of death passed over the Passover meal. The armies of Egypt all drowned in their chariots out of the Red Sea. I saw it happen. I was a part of it. But I was never in control. It wasn't about me. It was never about me. If only I had not forgotten that truth. At the burning bush, it was all about me. That's why I asked God, please send somebody else. God was a little upset about that. I was focusing on my weakness instead of God's promise. But the longer I led this beautiful and stubborn as mule people, the more confidence I gained. I became their leader. I spoke for God. I even saw the glory of the great I Am. My face shone with His reflection. I learned dependence on God in my weakness. But I forgot dependence on God in my strength. Here's where it happened. It was just after Miriam had died. We've been out wandering in the wilderness for years. The people still grumble. They still lack trust. They still blame me for their hard and fearful hearts. So the Lord told me to speak to a rock that the people and the cattle could drink and live. I no longer had Miriam's help, but I didn't think I needed her anymore because I had been leading God's people and doing God's work. So I told Aaron, get everybody together. I took the same staff that God used at that burning bush, the same staff that worked miracles in Egypt, I took my powerful staff in my powerful hands and put myself on the same level as God. You hard-hearted, stiff-necked people, I yelled out. Your grumbling has offended God's honor and mine, but oh, we're going to bring forth water from this hard rock. Though God commanded me to speak to the rock with my trembling voice, I took that powerful staff and I smacked that rock twice to show who's really in charge here. Oh, the people got their water, but I, who was saved through water, was now condemned through water. I forgot the most important lesson in being a servant of God. It's not about me. Since I made Moses as important as God, I'm stuck on this mountain while I can now see and hear Joshua leading God's people into the promised land, their final march home. From here, I can see the promised land just over that ridge. But I'm not going to be going in. We buried Aaron out in the wilderness. God himself will bury me here on this crag. I'm going to have to wait for the day of resurrection until I see the land of promise fulfilled for me. Now being barred from the promised land might seem like a mighty harsh punishment for hitting on a lousy rock. Sometimes it feels that way to me. But this was not simple disobedience. I made myself 
as important as God. I stopped depending on his word and thought I could do it all myself. God should have buried me right then and there at the rock of testing. Boy, I'm glad he didn't. Because he gave me another chance to learn that whether I feel powerful or utterly inadequate, it's not about me. So after we buried Aaron, and I'm on my own, the people, imagine this, became impatient again. But this time the Lord sent poisonous snakes. Their bite burned. People died. But when they returned to the Lord and confessed their sin, I prayed for them. It was always my honor to pray for God's people. And God gave a way for the people to be saved. Now this time, I think God has me figured out, I didn't have to speak. This time, I had no need for that staff. It wasn't about me at all. Instead, I was told to take some metal, to shape it into a snake, just like the ones biting and killing the people, and put it up on a pole. I have to admit, shaping a serpent seemed rather strange at the time. I had seen the finger of God write the commandments. And now the same God who a while back told me to pulverize a golden model of a calf, a herd animal, was now asking me to shape a bronze model of a snake. <laughs> a snake of all things. Can you believe it? I think you know about the snake, the tempter, the enemy who got us kicked out of the garden in the first place. A snake had taught us idolatry to begin with. But the bronze snake hoisted on a pole was not to be worshipped. It wasn't an idol. That snake became a symbol of our sin. The bronze serpent was a sign of the punishment and death that our sins deserved. But that twisted shape, lifted up before God, became sin for us. Our constant grumbling, our failure to trust, our stubborn rejection, our hard hearts strung up on a tree. Anyone who looked up at that curse in the wilderness looked up and lived. Well, here I stand on this mountain. My day is about to end, and I can see the promised land far off. In the distance, I can hear God's people begin the journey home. The Lord will come again really soon to plant this, my old body, in the warm, fertile ground. But while I wait for the Lord to come, that bronze serpent is a huge comfort. It's a reminder that God's going to continue leading his people without Moses. God will fulfill his promise in his time and in his way. So even when those stiff-necked people sin, rebel, grumble, and turn away, God himself is going to provide a way, a means of forgiveness, a sign of God's anger poured out and satisfied, lifted high in a pole, and all who look to that will live. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus Christ.